It's live. It's live. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. This is uh, Professor Stacy Strong welcoming you to the inaugural session of uh, the Private International Law Interest Group webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, as I said, we're going to have a really interesting day today. Hopefully, you all have figured out your own technology. If you have any questions, you can certainly go to your group chat line, and we'll try to figure those out. Um, but you'll also hear that we can use that group chat line in order for you to pose questions to our speakers who are both fantastic. So I, I'm going to take a brief moment to introduce them to you. They need no introduction. Um, you probably are all very familiar with their accomplishments already. But our, our first speaker is Professor Louise Ellen Tights of the Roger Williams School of Law in Rhode Island. Um, Louise is fantastic. She is experienced at all sorts of different international organizations. Um, most recently, she was first secretary at the Hague Conference on Private International Law in The Hague, um, with primary responsibility for family law um, matters, including the 1980 and the 1996 conventions, as well as other projects involving mediation, the Malta process involving Sharia-based legal systems, and relocation. She has also um, served as a visiting scholar at Unsichal in Vienna and has lectured all over the world, both here in the United States and in other countries. She, was a, a, she graduated from Yale College and from Southern Methodist University School of Law and then clerked for Judge John Brown of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth District. Um, and since then, she's been, as I said, lecturing around the world, writing numerous fantastic articles and books. Um, one of her better-known works in this particular field is her treatise, Transnational Litigation, which was published in 1999, and she is busy at work on a second edition. And she's also working on a case book entitled Comparative Law with Peter Winship. Um, our discussant today, who will also hopefully be contributing some of his own experience, is Professor David Stewart from Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. Um, prior to joining Georgetown, uh, David was with the U.S. Department of State, where he was the assistant legal advisor for private international law. Before taking on that position, he was the assistant legal advisor for in a number of different areas, including diplomatic law and litigation, African affairs, human rights and refugees, law enforcement and intelligence, and international claims and investment disputes. Um, he has edited the multi-volume digest of U.S. practice in international law for a number of years and has won awards for his teaching at Georgetown. Um, amongst his other many organizations that he is involved with, David is one of the reporters on the Restatement Fourth of Foreign Relations Law, and he also is a, is a Yaley. He has his JD from Yale, his bachelor's from, from Princeton, and his LLM in International Legal Studies from New York University. I'm going to let David and Luis talk a little bit more about the precise formats, um, but essentially we are hoping to have a very hands-on and interactive session. Um, I'm going to sign off and kind of keep an eye on any questions that you have coming in via email, but um, hopefully we will get started and you all will learn many things. You can tell I'm reaching for my, my uh, tech equipment. So, David, over to you. Thanks very much, thanks very uh, much uh, uh, Professor. And professor, let me yeah, um, express my thanks to you not only for organizing this, but, uh, this webinar, but also for the work that you do on the private international uh, interest group. It's a great undertaking. Uh, through the American uh, Society of International Law and a, and a wonderful means of educating folks uh, about private international law and, and promoting uh, the topic in the United States. Uh, and Professor Tights, it's always a, a great pleasure to be uh, working with you and to uh, ask you some, some questions about the field in which you've um, been so active and contributed so much. On the assumption that um, on, um, on this webinar there are some folks who, who may not be entirely familiar with the, uh, the term private international law and what uh, many of us think that it encompasses, let me, um, let me ask you perhaps to begin with a, with a brief description of what uh, what is typically meant by private international law. And uh, it's a, a course that's often not taught in law school, certainly in the United States under that term, but is often a required course in many um, other uh, legal systems. So for American lawyers, it's not an unfamiliar um, uh, experience to encounter somebody in an international or transnational setting starts talking about private international law and to have uh, the first question of being, my goodness, I didn't study that, I don't really know what they're talking about. So could you give us maybe a, a brief description of, in your experience, which has been very multi-jurisdictional, what uh, that term encompasses? Um, I think that there are 
multiple meanings to it, depending who is responding. Um, the classical definition, I think, or meaning to most people, especially overseas, is what we often consider conflicts of law courses in the U.S. Jurisdiction, uh, recognition and enforcement, and applicable law. Um, I think there's another meaning. Sometimes one talks about private international law in contrast to public international law. So what you might think of as international private law. Um, and to some people that includes things like contracts, all sorts of private law issues. Um, and I think increasingly to many people, and I think David, you've written about this as well. Um, it's often defined by the portfolio and work of several international or intergovernmental organizations, in particular uh, the Hague Conference, UNCITRAL, UNIDWA, and then regional ones such as the OAS. But it looks at the portfolio of their work and that happens to match with the portfolio in the State Department of the um, Legal Department Private International Law which you were the assistant legal advisor of at one point I know so um, I think it's it's a broad range but I, I think most of us look at it in terms of the work of these organizations that are focused on harmonization and or unification. You use the term international private law, and I take it you mean by that the, the work that goes on in these international intergovernmental organizations that affects private interests, for example, uh, model law and secured transactions or um, issues concerning adoption and abduction, things that uh, ordinarily might not think of the governments, at least in our sense, of being directly involved in, but they are because it's taking place in an intergovernmental organization and affecting private rights. I think so and some such as the Hague Conference are focused more on jurisdiction recognition and enforcement and applicable law and do not get as involved in the substantive harmonization of the law. Right so some parts are procedural and some are more substantive. Uh, from the point of view of a, of a um, an aspiring uh, practitioner or a young practitioner, in what areas are you most likely, a U.S. practitioner that is, what areas are you most likely to encounter questions of, uh, of private international law? I, I guess when we're talking about uh, jurisdiction and conflicts in applicable law, it's fairly unusual for U.S. courts to think about those in terms of the, of the concept of private international law, but is that, is that where you're more, most likely to come up against these issues? Um, I, I think that most lawyers in today's global economy increasingly come up with some issues that deal with private international law. So often it's transactional and it involves whether to use something like the Vienna Convention on the International Sale of Goods the CISC, which is one of UNCITRAL's work, or if they do family law, it crosses borders often, so they often deal with the work of the Hague Conference. Um, dispute resolution, international litigation, arbitration, mediation, and I think a reflection of the increased role that these areas play at least for a U.S. practitioner, is the increasing number of private international law cases that have gone before the U.S. Supreme Court um, involving issues such as cross-border family law, um, involving jurisdiction, involving judgments. Um, for instance, there were three family law cases, Hague abduction cases, in the U.S. Supreme Court in the last four years. Um, there was an extraterritorial application of law, Kiobel, which some would say is public, not private, but it raises the same issues, some of the same issues. Daimler, which is um, jurisdiction and parent subsidiary. So increasingly, in the court's limited docket, they're finding place for these cases, and certainly the circuit courts are also um, involved in this area. 
So the probably is probability is that um, uh, U.S. practitioners are actually directly involved in issues of private international law without knowing that that's what uh, many po folks would call them. I think that's the best example of that is, for instance, if you're doing a transaction that involves the sale of goods, um, increasingly students are learning in law school about the International Sale of Goods Convention, but 20 years ago no one, or I shouldn't say no one, but very few of my colleagues taught it unless they were teaching a very specialized course. And so often practitioners didn't even know that there was this convention that might in fact apply. Right. Uh, you mentioned a number of the institutions, uh, organiza international organizations in which international, private international law is, is discussed and sometimes uh, developed or formulated. Um, you've had personal experience in a number of those, Hague Conference and UNCITRAL. Can you say a few words about um, how the process works uh, and about your experiences in those organizations? Because most people, I think, are, are not particularly familiar with them. And I think that's right, and one really gets more of a sense when one is inside. It's sort of like being inside the sausage factory. So um, I obviously am most familiar with the Hague Conference, not only from my um, time there as first secretary, but before that from uh, being on U.S. delegations and writing and, and working in the area. But um, the three that are primarily involved in inter um, intergovernmentals that are primarily involved in harmonization, unification, are the Hague Conference, UNCITRAL, and UNIDWA. Hague Conference has 78 members. It is increasingly becoming global. It's the oldest of the three, and I, of course, obviously have to um, uh, say, say even more about, about it, probably because I know more about it, but it was for, uh, founded in 1893, and its purpose is the unification of, of law, but um, of private international law. It um, has basically 38 conventions that have come out since um, 1955 that fall into, um, it has conventions from before that, but from uh, that period, that fall into three primary groups. International child protection, such as the Hague abduction, the intercountry adoption, the 1996 Child Protection Convention, the 2007 Maintenance Convention. Um, the second category, legal cooperation and litigation, so that would be Hague Evidence, Hague Service Convention, um, Hague Apostille, and then it has commercial and financial, um, including thing, the just completed work or almost completed work on principles of applicable law, um, the Securities Convention, uh, the Trust Convention, and the members um, basically set the agenda and then the Permanent Bureau, which in the other organizations is no more as the um, Secretariat, do the, they basically do the normative work, the research surveys, and help with drafting, and then help with technical assistance and post-convention implementation or services that often goes with this. Um, the Hague Conference really, until 1990, was primarily Eurocentric and had just over 30 members. And since then, it has added uh, 48 members, and many of those members have joined since 2000. And if one were to look at the map, uh, one would see that all the con the the uh, six continents are covered, but um, Africa is still not as um, involved in membership. The Hague Conference also has connections with 145 countries. One does not have to be a member of the Hague Conference to decide to become, to accede to a, a convention. So the Hague Abduction Convention has over 90 uh, countries that have acceded or ratified, even though the, the conference itself only has 78 members, 
and one of those members, by the way, is the European community. UNCITRAL is connected with the UN, um, and it has uh, the UN Commission on International Trade Law, which was established uh, by the UN. And it has 60 members who are elected by the General Assembly for a six-year period, and then other countries are observers. Um, it, I think, is perhaps a um, good opportunity for emerging economies and for the entire geographic range of countries to be included and especially in the area of development it really is a place for countries that have not um, that are are really emerging economies to have more of a voice um, and it therefore also is involved not just in conventions but a lot of its very important work is in the form of model laws that these countries can in use in their um, early and later stages. UNIDWA is left from the League of Nations. It has, I think, 63 members. It's based in Rome. UNCITRAL, by the way, is in Vienna and the Hague Conference is in the Netherlands. Um, UNIDWA has, I think, 63 members, and it has a structure where it has a, a secretariat, but it has a governing board, which is elected from the members, and then there's a general assembly. Um, I'm less familiar with it, but it obviously does a whole range of work as well. Um, in terms of the process, at least at the Hague Conference and at UNCITRAL, work is by consensus. The Permanent Bureau will work on, on background materials, help with drafting, but the actual product and the meetings are by consensus. Um, that was not always the case at the Hague Conference, but it changed around 2000. And then the countries send their representatives to these these meetings. Um, so um, I would mention that in terms of sort of the process and what's involved, there is an incredible amount of work done on very limited budgets. For instance, at the Hague Conference, our budget is just over, th was, I should say, it was just over 3 million euros. And of that, money, much of it went to help and assist with post-convention work. Um, all right, that, that's, um, that sounds like a, a, a pretty complicated um, a group of organizations. Where in, um, uh, and, and mostly done by, represent, where, where folks are represented, uh, governments represent the interest, and, and you mentioned that um, at least in the case of some delegations, I take it the United States private parties can be members of delegations, um, and, yes, and you, in, you've in done fact, that yourself. The, the U.S. State Department is particularly good about including um, private sector and NGOs either as part of the delegation or at least involved in the process and it consults them both before and during uh, uh, negotiations which makes sense because that way they have both a better product I think but one that will be more acceptable when it's finished and more possible of implementation. From a, from a domestic point of view uh, where do uh, where, where do folks um, look to get involved in issues of private international law? Are they um, obviously the American Society of International Law, private interest uh, international law interest group is a good way to do it uh, because you get to see webinars like this and to participate in meetings. But uh, beyond that, uh, what other? You've been quite active in a number of organizations. Can you say a word about that? Sure. Um... The, besides ASIL, the American Bar Association obviously is very active in this area and the international section of the ABA, which um, I'm on the council of and David, you're also on the council of. And within that, there's actually something called the Joint Editorial Board, which is a collaboration between the Uniform Law Commission and the ABA international section to look at 
uh, projects that have an international component. Also, obviously, the American branch of the ILA is very active in this area and has interna the international ILA actually has committees that work on many projects that sometimes end up making an impact or being considered by UNCITRAL. Um, in fact, um, David, you're the president of the American branch of the ILA, so you can say more about it perhaps, but also the ALI is taking up increasingly international or cross-border areas and um, by doing the restatement on, of um, foreign relations law, I think that's a significant part. Within the government, um, I've worked primarily with the State Department and the Office on Private International Law, but in the family law area, Consular Affairs also works. And then the Federal Trade Commission has an international section that, that one can work with. Um, and Commerce has one, and, and of course the Justice Department has an international litigation part as well. And through all of these, all of these, uh, these endeavors, folks get educated about private international law and, and its relevance. I just uh, I'll say a word about the State Department, which has had an office uh, or, or individuals for a number of years involved in, uh, in private international law. It's in a way counterintuitive because the government pays attention to governmental obligations and uh, you wouldn't think necessarily about being involved in, in things like secured transactions or family law issues, but it's precisely because these issues are negotiated, discussed, negotiated, debated in intergovernmental fora that um, the State Department established an office a number of years ago to be, in effect, the coordinating point for U.S. representation. As you pointed out, heavily reliant on uh, connections through the ABA and ASIL and um, a number of other organizations, a lot of academics and practitioners are involved on a long line of folks going all the way back to Ambassador Dick Kearney and Adair Dyer who who himself served at the Hague conference. He was Deputy Secretary General at one point, I think. Yes, and still a lot of folks. So the, the I guess the point I wanted to make is, is for those who are listening and think, well, private international law sounds a little bit esoteric and European. Not at all. It's actually a very active, vibrant, and very relevant uh, area. And what I tell my students is you may not know you're involved in private international law, but you are. And lots of opportunities to participate in it. Can we move from... Sorry. I just mentioned one other that you that obviously relates to the State Department, but the State Department has the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Private International Law that now tends to meet once a year, but it's open to all, and it's either it rotates between being held at Georgetown and, or GW Law School, and it's a great opportunity to hear about all the developments and to comment and um, give uh, feedback on projects that you would like to see the U.S. government take up or encourage at these intergovernmental organizations. And you, of course, organized those meetings for many years. I did, and, and uh, John Kim, who's the current assistant legal advisor, uh, does that now. And if folks are interested in following that up, there is a, a particular website uh, on uh, www.state.gov. If you go there and, and type in private international law, I'll take you to uh, the page that that office creates. Could, could you say a few words, uh, Professor Tights, about particular projects that you've been interested in? We've been talking mostly at the organizational level. I want to maybe put a little bit of, uh, of, of grist on the, on the table. Specific things that you've been involved in or specific projects that are ongoing that you'd like to say a word about to put some, some uh, I don't know, meat on the bones here? Sure. At the Hague conference, I had primary responsibility for um, much of the family law portfolio, and the uh, work that's going on there is not just in drafting new conventions, but also in coming up with tools that help implement and um, ensure proper operation of conventions. The Hague Conference doesn't have anybody who sort of oversees 
Um, there's no Supreme Court equivalent to say, oh, you're interpreting this wrongly. There is what's called a special commission every four or five years on, on existing conventions where they will get together the countries that are that are um, have ratified or acceded and talk about how the convention is working, where the problems are, practical operational issues, as well as important issues of policy. And from those special commissions often come new work. So for instance, in 2011 and 12, there was a special commission on the 1990s Six convention and 1980 child abduction convention and from that one of the important projects that came out was a uh, working group to write a guide to good practice in connection with article 13 B which is the grave risk exception to return of a child and there is significant variation in how it is applied and construed and the idea was to have a group of experts from 2025 countries work on this and then it would go before all of the other countries for comment. That is ongoing. It's chaired by um, the Chief Justice of the Australian Family Co Court. Um, the other project, one of the other projects that came out of this was an experts working group on looking into the need for an instrument, either binding or non-binding, to deal with cross-border recognition and enforcement of voluntary agreements in international child disputes. So if you had a mediated agreement or a voluntary agreement on issues um, that involved children a way to ensure recognition. Um, also at the Hague in the family law area there has been some work on cross-border surrogacy and parentage um, which should be considered by the council in um, actually next month in March on whether they would do further work. There's also a project for cross-border recognition of child, of, um, sorry, civil protection orders such as domestic violence orders um, cross-border that um, the, there is interest by some countries in moving forward to a convention. Um, there's also work, uh, study underway on, on the rights, uh, applicable law issues in connection with um, unmarried couples. Um, there's a project on judgments that's probably getting the most attention right now. Starting in 1992-93, the Hague Conference undertook a project on um, jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgments, drafting a convention. And for a number of reasons of which much has been written, that process stopped after a part one diplomatic session in June 2001. And then subsequently, instead of a comprehensive convention on recognition and enforcement, the decision was made to work on a convention that would deal with recognition and enforcement of choice of court agreements. And that convention was finished in 2005, um, but has not yet gone into effect. It will shortly because the European community has actually um, indicated that they uh, will sign it. Mexico uh, ratified it in um, 2007, I believe, and so it takes two countries to become effective. There's also um, work being done on um, applicable law. At UNCITRAL, I think there are two interesting projects that I'm familiar with. Um, one is the working group, working group three, on online dispute resolution. Um, which deals with um, rules and um, is aimed at trying to 
find mechanisms for um, inexpensive and and um, inexpensive and um, I guess efficient mechanisms to provide relief to small businesses and consumers in cross-border transactions that are primarily low dollar but high volume. And that work started, um, UNCITRAL had been doing some work all, all through the, the first decade of the, the 21st century, but it started more uh, earnestly in 2008, 9, 10. And the working group has been working on rules for online dispute resolution. But one of the tricky issues is how to ensure consumer protection and balance the needs of some countries and regional economic integration organizations, such as the EU, with um, finding mechanisms that can be enforced um, quickly and 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 cheaply, and different views on the ability of consumers to to agree to pre-dispute binding arbitration. And this group just met uh, last week, the week before, and there was also a proposal by the government of Colombia and the U.S. for a uh, chargeback system, chargeback not just of credit card but payment systems. And then the decision was made by the working group basically to put things um, on hold for a bit and the commission will meet in July I guess and decide whether to go forward but there has been um, the last two, three years at least, um, a difficulty coming to consensus. And that's one of the, the issues I think that comes up increasingly in some of these intergovernmental organizations such as the Hague Conference and UNCITRAL. The need to come up with consensus and balancing that with the work of some regional organizations and countries' own legal systems. You're bringing together legal systems from 60 countries or more at UNCITRAL and at the Hague Conference, 78 countries, trying to come up with, with solutions that work within the, the framework and the policies of these countries. One other thing I might mention going on at UNCITRAL is uh, Working Group 2, which looks at commercial arbitration generally, but um, has been encouraged to consider and is now considering, in fact, um, Stacy has been very um, active in this as well, in getting um, the Working Group to consider a um, convention that would recognize the agreements that come from mediation or conciliation in a commercial context in a way paralleling the, paralleling the work at the Hague Conference in the family law where we also had been working on the um, area of conciliation and voluntary agreement. Um, and David, you know more about what's going on at the OAS and maybe you would share that with everyone because that's something that I don't know that much about. Well, I'm glad you asked that. I was going to I was going to say something about the OAS because it also has a long tradition of being involved in in uh, what we call today private international law matters going back as far as the Bustamante code and most people don't uh, don't know that in some areas there are parallel conventions um, to Hague or UNCITRAL uh, with our own in our own hemisphere for example on um, enforcement of arbitration awards on judgments on service um, actually even on proof of foreign law so one um, one source for that is to go to the OAS website and type in international law uh, on the uh, on the finder uh, tool and you'll find um, a ready database of OAS uh, instruments including in the area of international law with lists of parties and so on it's a good uh, resource 
the OAS has had in the past a practice of convening uh, hemispheric conferences for this purpose called by their Spanish acronym CDIPS um, for Conference on International uh, Private Law and that's been the, the source for many of these conventions. Unfortunately the the last CBIT, CDIP was not entirely successful. Um, it got uh, into an area of um, particularly consumer law where many countries had strong feelings and it wasn't possible to find a single approach. You mentioned generally the rule of consensus which has a very practical uh, purpose to it in this area because if you adopt a rule that a substantial number of countries are not going to uh, comply with or implement it's not going to be very effective. And so there hasn't been a CDIP for a number of years uh, and sometimes people say maybe it's time to do another one but then the question is what would be the next set of, of topics. There are a couple of ongoing projects nonetheless in secured transactions, in uh, choice of law, particularly in the contractual matter, uh, contractual area and uh, in some pretty technical areas which if anybody's interested we can go into uh, but one for example in um, in the area of electronic warehouse receipts and the, uh, and the idea of having a a hemispheric uh, uh, set of rules that would provide for negotiable electronic warehouse receipts that would really be quite a an engine of, uh, of uh, development in the agricultural sector. So that's something to be talked about. I imagine that there are a number of questions and, and just before we, I hope there are a number of questions from our, our listeners and, uh, before we put a lot of topics on the table. Before we do that let me just ask one last question if I can because I think it generates a number of of issues that might be a uh, uh, source of some questions and comments by our participants and that is uh, you'd mentioned the difference or, or made a distinction between some of the international private international instruments that are procedural in nature and some that are more substantive for example uh, in the area of service of process um, or discovery requests you have a hey, conference uh, mechanisms that really serve to um, uh, create a channel by which uh, requests can be transmitted from central authorities and, and that's also true to an extent in the area. So that's really a way of bridging differences in legal systems so that you have uh, a better chance of getting uh, requests complied with. And those instruments are a little bit different than those that try to arrive at substantive harmonization to use the term you was of adopting a rule uh, a substantive rule of law. The latter both kinds pose problems for states, in particular for the United States because many of the areas you've talked about um, are not uh, those that fall ordinarily within the competence of the federal government. I'm thinking clearly about uh, family law matters. Uh, and uh, we know that in some of these instances um, federalism becomes an issue because treaties necessarily become federal law and sometimes states say well uh, you know that's something that we've done not the federal government and you got a treaty now you're going to take it away from us. In the area of private international law that poses a problem because um, uh, most countries are not federal in nature, most are unitary and, and therefore they don't face this and they, they adopt rules that become hard for the United States. Do you have any, it might be a source of questions, but do you have any comments about some of the challenges that the United States faces in particular in the area of private international law? And then we can, I'd suggest we open it up to the comments and questions. Um, I guess the most recent and best known example of this is the choice of court agreements convention or COCA um, which was completed in 2005. The US as I said had been very active and in fact had been um, one of the initiators of the original judgments project and the convention is sitting um, and has not yet been ratified. It hasn't gone to the Senate. Part of the problem, nobody thinks it is a bad convention. It is all a question of how do we implement it and it is this issue of implementation by federal law only or by a combination of federal state cooperative federalism. The Uniform Law Commission has been working with the State Department in this area. I think increasingly the conventions do in fact um, touch more areas that have often been areas of state law and yet 
they now involve cross-border issues. And coming up with solutions, creative solutions, that will make it possible to maintain the integrity, I think, of state law, but also implement conventions in a way that the State Department and the federal government can be sure that there will indeed be full implementation and cooperations because they obviously when they when they deposit their instrument um, on a, a convention they're saying we're going to make sure that the that everybody complies and and I think that's difficult and I think there are are small p political issues that have gotten increasingly involved in many areas of private international law and I don't just mean in this area but for instance in the the family law area trying to do further work on um, the jurisdiction and applicable law dealing with unmarried couples creates political issues for some. Um, the same with surrogacy. Should, that becomes a political issue. And I think that raises issues for whether it can, these kinds of projects, even if there is a final project that or final product, I should say, that comes out of it, the question is, can you get it um, ratified and implemented in the U.S., or it, do you just have a convention? Right. Now, I would say that there are some. There is some question about the role of consensus in some or, of the organizations, and some would say that even if you're not sure that it's a project that your country needs, you might still be willing to be involved in the negotiations and allow the project to go forward. And the best example of that perhaps might be the current work on the judgments project. Um, there are some in the U.S. who don't feel we should be actively involved. And one question is, do we at least participate even if we're not sure that in the end this is a convention that we will become a party to? That, that often is a question that has to be addressed on a case-specific basis. And, um, and we know that when, uh, when those questions come up, uh, the uh, Department of State um, is uh, very concerned about hearing from um, interested, I don't like the term stakeholders, but I'll use it here, folks that have an interest in the particular issue uh, and not making a, a unilateral decision, but hearing on all sides. And both, both the issues that you discuss are, are um, freely debated on which there are strong views. Certainly on the question of federalism, it's nothing new. We had the same debate over arbitration many years ago, uh, decades ago. Uh, and it comes up in lots of different ways. People have strong views about it. Um, one could also add maybe to your list of, of challenges the fact that treaties in our current situation don't seem to be faring very well in the Senate. Uh, and there are many people who think, well, the treaty pathway might have been good in, in the last half century, but today we need to look uh, more at other instruments such as legislative guidance or model laws. Uh, and, the, and there are a variety of disputes. I see we have some questions. I don't know whether uh, Professor Strong wants to ask them, but you've already started to address one of them. So let's take up uh, Aaron uh, Sinowitz's question uh, on the Judgments Project. Uh, and he says, do you see a path of acceptance for the proposed Judgments Convention? One interesting difference between the general U.S. approach and the Judgments Project is uh, non-recognition for case-specific procedural fraud. Um, it's an excellent question, and actually there was a, um, an issue raised about that in, in the, today's letters obligatory, uh, if, you, if you follow that, on the difference between these two issues. Um, and we know that distinction actually arises under the uniform uh, uh, laws in the United States. Do um, you have any comments on, 
on uh, systemic fraud versus case specific fraud in uh, in terms of judgments enforcement if not I'll offer an opinion I'll let you offer it because you read the blog I hadn't yet read the blog uh, well it, it raises the same, essentially the Chevron same Chevron issue it's a she Chevron issue and the difference is that in um, in uh, in our, our domestic law we have two possible approaches one permits a court to refuse to accept or recognize to give effect to a foreign judgment if there is uh, has been some sort of um, a fraud or or a due process violation in the specific case and then a somewhat older version which still exists in the law of some states which says the relevant standard is whether the system legal system as a whole is fair and adequate uh, and one can look at the specific cases uh, and discern that in the in the case where the latter standard is the relevant one systemic fraud uh, courts tend to struggle with the proposition of having to sit in judgment on the on the adequacy of a foreign legal system as a whole it would be much preferable to say well, I don't need to judge the system of Ruritania as a whole I need to judge whether this defendant uh, in losing this case in Ruritania got a fair shake or not and one can look at some of these cases and, and say um, courts go out of their way to avoid the general the general indictment in some other cases courts have been quite willing to stand up and say there are not many cases but a few and say we look at this foreign legal system and we just don't think it's adequate I'm not taking sides right two different right. approaches but the judgments convention seems to only have if I understand it correctly the general indictment and not the case specific provision and I guess and the question Aaron is raising is is one preferable to the other and and I think this was also something that was considered both in the ALI um, federal statute, the Judgments Project, that um, Linda Silberman and Andy Lowenfeld were co-reporters on, and also I think came up in the revision to the Uniform Foreign Money Judgments Recognition Act. And um, I, some would say that Often on in the individual case, you can handle some of it through due process issues. Um, um, one way to I haven't, I haven't seen the newest draft that just came out. I guess about a week ago. One way to answer Aaron's question is to is to respond with another one and to say, uh, from a practitioner's point of view, would it be preferable to uh, be able to defend against? A particular judgment on the grounds that uh, that particular defendant didn't get a fair shake in that particular case as opposed to having to convince the judge uh, to uh, in effect indict the entire legal system of a foreign country certainly uh, with Chevron I think that's right um, it would be easier for a judge to say there was fraud and did say fraud in the individual case without saying the entire system is corrupt one might also uh, offer a sort of a historical perspective that Aaron might want to respond to and say, look, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, one might have been a little bit more justified in, in saying uh, the system of X, um, put in the Cold War context, um, uh, East versus West, an entire system of justice is defective. But today, with... Uh, with uh, progress, one might say, in many areas, emergence of human rights, procedural rights, uh, rule of law efforts, and so on, um, it's a lot harder to say the entire system of X, regional or national, is defective and much more justified to say, look, if we're going to refuse to enforce a particular judgment, you have to show that that particular case was, was defective, that particular um, judgment debtor didn't get a fair shake, and let's not go indicting everybody for it. Uh, but it's, I think it's a question of what's what's the most practical um, and and most um, uh, useful approach for a court, um, or or let's put it in principal terms, the the presumption ought to be in the in favor of enforcement of judgments. Right, and and certainly for a U.S. practitioner, it may be easier to deal with the individual case um, I would think in so. another legal system to then to try and get a judge in the US anyway to say the entire system is corrupt in another country. Now US judges and, don't seem very com comfortable doing, uh, doing right. the thing. Well yeah. and, and that's that question about the roles of the judiciary versus 
um, the executive and foreign relations areas too, yes? It is, it is remarkable to me, uh, having worked at one point in human rights and worked extensively on the human rights country reports that the State Department uh, produces, which were, were mandated by Congress and, and developed for an entirely different purpose, to find those reports showing up in the context of litigation over uh, enforcement of a judgment of a court of a given country. But life is full of surprises. Uh, there's a question from my uh, a colleague, uh, Jeanette Tramhell of, uh, of the OAS, who is an expert in this area and is working on a number of, of uh, very important uh, and creative private international law projects, given that many developing countries do not necessarily have the expertise in these technical areas, nor the resources to attend extensive technical meetings. Is the development of PIL being largely driven by interests of member states in the developed world? How can we assure a more balanced set of views and contributions? I think that's an excellent question. It is. Uh, and it is, let me let me posit something that might evoke an answer. Uh, in these meetings, uh, Professor Tights, that you've been in, have you seen an imbalance? I mean, clearly in something like UNCTRAL or, or the Hague Conference, you do have representatives from many countries that are not, that fall on both sides of the divide that uh, Jeanette has, has. Do you see that um, one dominates the other? I think at least Often at UNCTRAL, the developing countries have more say than they might have at other organizations. But at both, there is the focus on consensus. Um, I think one, and I think it's a really difficult question to know what's going on in the margins always. But um, I think one of the things that has happened is the, at least for instance at the Hague Conference, one of the things that, that has been noticeable is that certain regions have begun to work together more as a region rather than as individual countries. And the example I would give is Latin America. Yeah. Um, we, the Hague Conference had, has a, a um, regional office in Buenos Aires and Ignacio Genachea is wonderful and he consults with all of the countries. He has meetings of all of the countries before the council meeting as does Asadip. And they go to council, which sets the agenda at the Hague Conference, with shared views on many matters, but at least a sense of where matters have a regional impact. This is equally so, obviously, in the European community. And at the Hague Conference, the European Com Union is actually a member itself. Um, but in, most, in so many areas it has competence, so it speaks for the countries. They have coordination, but, but the commission speaks for the countries. And these countries or groups' interest in projects has a big impact in deciding the agenda for the, the, the work of the conference. And I know the Hague Conference has a regional office in the Asia Pacific in Hong Kong. <coughs> Excuse me, UNCTRAL opened up a regional office in Seoul, Korea. And so I think the regional outreach is one way to incorporate and include the voices of many of the countries that have not been as active in these organizations. I'd agree with that, and I'd add a few more comments. First is the importance, you alluded to this, the importance of the organizations themselves in, in, um, 
in addressing the interests of all their members and in assisting their members. Um, even in, the, in an um, organization in the OAS where, where the Department of International Law uh, is directly involved in this, it's a very small group of people but they are quite intent on uh, on representing the interests of the of the hemisphere, the particular and out and reaching out to everybody in the hemisphere, trying to uh, get the input and get people's involvement and get their representation. So, the international organizations themselves, to the extent that there is some substance in which that, and I come back to this, the idea that it's the developed countries dictating rules to the less developed. The international organizations themselves provide a counterweight to that. Secondly, I'd say in, in my experience, um, it is frequently, not always, but almost always the case that even the smaller countries tend to be represented by people who actually know what they're doing, often educated in, in Europe or, or, or uh, in the United States. It's not infrequent where you, you come across somebody who is actually quite expert representing a smaller country so that the size of the country, the amount of its GDP, um, isn't at all a real indication of whether they have um, the ability to understand or to contribute constructively. Third, again, if you want an effective uh, private international law regime, it's got to include, uh, it can't just be among the developed countries, it by definition does. Many of the, these projects are intended precisely uh, to uh, um, assist in development, I, I, and Jeanette knows that she's involved in some of these things in the area, for example, of secured transactions or in the OAS, we have a project on on uh, simplified stock corporations or I mentioned electronic warehouse receipts where the object is to uh, provide a, a mechanism by which countries that have um, uh, the need of modernizing their systems can get assistance and and uh, and to participate more effectively in a in a developed economy. Um, one might say there's a counter example in uh, in Unidua, the outfit that you mentioned in uh, in Rome. There's an effort uh, over a number of years uh, to uh, adopt um, an international regime uh, involving um, uh, secured interests and in mobile equipment, known as the Cape Town. Um, the Cape Town uh, Convention, and it has a number of, of uh, protocols, but generally we're talking about big items of equipment, aircraft or large agricultural equipment or spacecraft. Well, almost by definition, those are things that to come are developed in, generated by the developed countries, and in many cases are used in or found in um, or benefit in one way or another the less developed countries. Uh, not everybody has spacecraft yet, they will eventually. And the convention is designed to provide a, a, a coherent system of representing and securing the interests of the of the um, of the owners and the, the financiers when that equipment moves across borders. Um, okay, so by definition you're dealing with things that generally speaking come from the more developed countries and often end up in the less developed countries. Is that dictating the law to the less developed or is that uh, uh, regulate, establishing a, a regulation that benefits everybody because it solves the problems of differences in or inadequacies in various uh, incompatibilities between various legal systems? I would tend to the to the um, to the latter definition, but could, people can have uh, have different. I think private international law, if you take it as a whole, uh, has an obligation not just to harmonize, but to contribute to economic political development, uh, and that's important. So it's just so the goal isn't just to harmonize, just to overcome the conflicts. It is to contribute substantially to the benefit of, of the legal systems that are involved. Well, and increase rule of law. Exactly. And. Yeah, and I mean, that's, the, that's the last thing, technical assistance you were mentioning. Well, rule of law, though, too, I was thinking about, for instance, the World Bank, and it has now indicated that countries um, ought to adopt certain conventions, such as the Hague Apostille Convention, to facilitate um, development. But um, I guess in terms of technical assistance, um, at least at the Hague conference, close to 70% of the work is not on new normative conventions, but on what are called post-convention services. And post-convention services ranges from simply helping, simply selling your wares, um, promoting the conventions, but it also means helping countries 
implement the convention, develop implementing legislation, set up central authorities. The Hague Conventions, the newer ones, have become more complicated, more complex, uh, such as intercountry adoption. And they require these central authorities, which are entities within the government that cooperate with other countries. And there are judges who interpret the conventions, so they're guides to good practice for design for users and, and for both central authorities. For instance, on the abduction convention, there's one on central authorities. There's one on um, um, different, uh, how on um, mediation in the convention, there are five or six different guides to good practice. As I said, there's one now that we're working on, uh, they were working on on the 13B grave risk. Um, and this technical assistance really is important because a, a country simply acceding to a convention doesn't necessarily mean that a child will come back through the convention, for instance, with the abduction convention. And on the other hand, this technical assistance becomes more important these days when governments are cutting back. So many of the governments that when I was at the Hague conference we dealt with, we're having major cutbacks. So 25% reduction of staff, let's say, in the central authority that deals with the Hague Child Abduction Convention. That means they have fewer resources, fewer people to work on these cases, and prompt return is, is uh, uh, essential. And so coming up with better ways to handle these practical problems is important and I think it will become increasingly so as conventions as I said become more sophisticated instead of being a, a five or six or twelve articles there are 40 or 45 articles and they increasingly need more cooperation mechanisms which takes training and and familiarity um, part of what's important with these conventions is getting the judges in each country to know about them. I mean, in the U.S., one of the important things that we have is trying to, to make sure that state and federal judges, but state as well, know about different conventions that are applicable. So, for instance, the Hague Abduction Convention. The Hague Conference set up a system of um, a network of judges and each country designates one or two, the US has four judges to the Hague Network judges and these judges are a link between judges in another country but also domestically helping to ensure that there is knowledge in the judiciary in the US about how these cases ought to be handled and so I think um, these things are important and they will become more important as governments have less and less um, opportunity and resources to, um, per, to spend on the conventions. It's clearly the case that many of the topics that are dealt with in international, private international law uh, fora are, are intrinsically difficult, particularly when you put them in a transnational context and you're dealing with different legal systems that have different ways of approaching them. And one of the reasons the process is often slow is there's a tremendous amount of learning and mutual understanding that has to go on, even on something like service of process, relatively simple, and then some of the more complicated things where the international international community has to get together and say, in effect, before you can establish the rules, figure out what the context and the contours of the problem really are in order to see what might be an, a consensus-based solution. We have another terrific question. Let me throw this one at you, uh, Professor Tights. Many people see uh, the world of private international law as dominated by international commercial arbitration. What are the other growth areas, the hot areas? You mentioned family law, insolvency, uh, and why are these going to be uh, growth areas? I suppose this is a question of particular interest to um, students and younger practitioners, but also I think for 
folks in international organizations and for people like you and me that try to teach this and get students excited about the possibilities. What's coming? I, in, uh, actually, in class today, I was I was making a prediction about what might be the next world, uh, the growth area behind international commercial arbitration. But let's see if we agree on this. Um, well, in terms of dispute resolution, probably conciliation and mediation, and online dispute resolution, yeah. and that's actually, as I said, there's been a a sort of impasse or, or block. Um, at UNCITRAL, but on the other hand, it's an area that increasingly can be used, for instance, in family law disputes, online dis mediation, yeah. um, and they're working in that area. So what was your area that was the growth area? Um, yeah, the broad area of inter intellectual, international intellectual property, particularly in the electronic cyber context. I think I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but uh, if I were sitting in a second or third year seat in a law school, I would be thinking hard about the possibilities that, in, in my view, inevitably have to emerge the international scene along those lines. I think that's a tremendous thing. And privacy. Privacy and, and privacy, of course, but many people don't think of privacy, personal data protection, as being a private international law thing, but rather more on the human rights side. Yes, well, and and family law, the Hague Abduction right. Convention, right. increasingly has be, has been taken up by the European Court of Human Rights, right. and so now on in sorry. Uh, well, in insolvency, many people don't know that the United States has actually enacted uh, an international uh, rule on insolvency. I think it's what is it, Chapter 15 of the uh, of the code. Uh, so as um, as insolvency depends on the economy, of course, but transnational insolvency, international. I'm not sure what the right term is, but it's become more prevalent. Uh, people need to know about that dimension, and it's uh, it's one that not. I don't know how many folks actually teach in that area do, but uh, our good friend Hal Berman was quite active in the area of insolvency and a number of federal judges do. All right, well we see uh, another question if I can. Um, many uh, in the United States courts often consider international matters from an interstate perspective. Ah. Is that appropriate in the PIL context or is there something unique about private international a court should change their analytical paradigm if so, how can we get courts thinking of that way? The Federal Judicial Center has international projects going on, but is that enough? That's a and, good question. And ASIL also has, of course, the bench book for judges on international law. But I, I always used to use it as an example how courts treated parallel litigation. Excellent, yes. Because they would use um, the either abstention doctrine or they would use domestic analogies and that really isn't the issue and um, I think the that in that area part of the it has been educating the judges and certainly um, the FJC's guides have been very helpful for the um, federal judiciary, but I also think that um, work being undertaken at some of the international organizations has helped that as well. Um, more study on on the area um, and the ALI, the um, the judgments project had a provision dealing with parallel litigation in it, a part of it. And there's some question about whether the Hague judgments project, the new one, would again have something on parallel litigation. But dealing with the questions of sovereignty and um, elements in cross-border parallel litigation is very different, I think, than dealing with um, domestic. I, that's just one that I can think of that is a significant difference when you cross borders. Right. Your comment uh, leads to another thought which is the relevance of European Union law. Often lost um, or at least not well understood and appreciated by um, by uh, our students or by practitioners who um, 
who may not fully appreciate the um, extent to which European law has begun to unify private international law issues among its member states. And um, uh, uh, well, increasingly, I tend to the view that a well-prepared international lawyer really has to know a good deal about not just the, the structure and, and overall uh, 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 legal uh, uh, venues of the European Union, but about how its uh, its rules on almost a not quite a daily basis, but monthly basis, affect um, issues of private international law. When you talk about parallel uh, litigation or enforcement of judgments and some other things, clearly it's relevant. Um, Fifteen years ago, folks really pay much attention to uh, those those questions, and now they are really important affairs. And I'm, I'm concerned about U.S. lawyers not understanding the dimension to which, when they deal in the international context, the importance of understanding where the European Union members are coming from. Um, well, and, and I think also um, there are the community has uh, the competence has has shifted in many areas to the community rather than the individual countries and there are increasing regulations and and directives there's the the work on ADR and on online dispute resolution which will come into effect um, there's also I think because of this the agenda and work, and I alluded to this earlier, of the community has an impact on the work of, of many of the intergovernmental organizations, either in, in encouraging further work or sometimes in giving it a less important number uh, in priority, um, not treating it as a as pressing a problem. Sometimes the community is working on something in an area, um, civil protection orders or whatever, where they would like to get their own regulation in place before they're willing to see or want to see it taken up on a broader than regional basis. And so I think in negotiations and in arguing for the agendas of the intergovernmental organizations, one has to be aware of what's going on in the community and where they will not budge on something because it's an area that they have, let's say, just legislated on and are unlikely to be in a position to, to move on it. So I think it, it really makes a difference. Uh, even within the Hague Conference, I know you had to deal on occasion with the tensions between a, uh, a global or universal or international approach and a regional approach. And as, um, as the regions become more actively involved, of course the OAS has long been involved, uh, but pays close attention to what's going on in the rest of the world. The EU becomes of obvious. Have the, the the problem of conflicts, the, the perennial problem of fragmentation of different approaches that that in a sense um, help the region, but then create different problems um, in interregional uh, debate. So. Uh, I guess uh, from a point of view of private international law, one might begin with a presumption that international rules are better than than regional rules because they serve more a, a, a broader interest. And, and if you have differing regional rules, you have conflicts that by PIL is intended to resolve. But that's a huge issue. Let's see. Here's another question. Which, which is probably why increasingly some of these organizations um, are focusing on um, soft law instruments on model laws. Some have focused more than others, but I think that's a reflection in part of trying to come up with solutions that are acceptable to everyone. And conventions, hard law is often harder to do in those circumstances. Much, much harder to do. And as we all know, so-called soft law has a habit of graduating into something harder over time. 
Um, one question I know you're going to like to answer, uh, what is the um, role or possible role of professional organizations, the American Bar Association, Canadian Bar Association, both of which, for example, have worked on a protocol for judges involved in cross-border class actions. How well do these initiatives fare? I might add, um, are these a good avenue for which uh, to pursue if you're a practitioner, maybe a student today, uh, getting involved? What is the role of the professional organization in all of this? Well, I, in, although I, we haven't really talked about international commercial arbitration, certainly the International Bar Association and its rules on evidence have had a huge impact on um, the practice. Um, the ILA and its work has has clearly had um, an impact on um, work. They were looking at part at transparency um, in in arbitration, in particular, more investor state. But that ended up going to UNCITRAL. Um, so I think. Sometimes these organizations um, can have an impact on the agendas of the um, intergovernmental organizations, but I think also sometimes their work becomes um, what is viewed as the acceptable practices. Certainly in the commercial area, that's often been the case. I'd add to that the importance of um, of people in the uh, in the industry, the sector, the profession, whatever we're talking about, of uh, being um, able to participate because they bring the real world practice. It's one thing for an academic, a government official, uh, to say, "Well, I see a problem here, which we might be able to to resolve if I write this draft this way." Uh, and then repeatedly throughout my experience, you go to a group of practitioners who work in the area who say, that's great in theory, but that's not how it works in practice. Practitioners, uh, professional organizations tend to bring a very realistic, um, experience-based uh, approach to many problems of private international law and to say it's going to work this way or here's the real problem or you have to take this into account. Certainly in the government, I know that the, the feeling I had, my successors, John Kim um, uh, and um, and others um, had Keith Loken, it was we wouldn't really want to move without talking to the folks who actually do it because it's what you're talking about affects their their practice, their livelihood, their area of experience, and um, and you want something that's realistic and going to be effective. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in private international law not just to be involved actively in something like the American Society, but also in in the um, uh, through the bar associations and in the other insta, uh, ways in which advisory committees and so on would be on delegations because they bring. Um, uh, much more than in the case of public international law, a, a necessary dimension. Well, and sometimes the 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 um, sort of regional work ends up having um, a larger impact. So, for instance, the Canadian Law Revision Committee um, and the the um, U.S. Uniform Law Commission have been working on civil protection orders, cross-border recognition and enforcement, but meanwhile the government of Canada has also took it to the Hague Conference, so it's going on multiple fronts that way. And there have been some efforts um, uh, between um, uh, professional organizations such as the Canadian Bar Association, the American Bar Association, the Mexican folks to coordinate uh, on on a, um, a sort of a neighborly basis because some issues uh, arise in that as good. Here's another hard question, which I will uh, uh, send your way. Can we say there is an American law of private international law? Um, Professor Briggs, uh, Adrian Briggs, has written an article or book recently on the English law of private international law. Are there are there uh, national or or, or um, uh, continental approaches to issues? Um, or is that really just, uh, in, in the case of the United States, really talking about the specific problems that we have as a federal, okay, the Canadian has some of the same problems, but not to the same extent? I guess it also depends how you define private international law. Yeah. So if we, going back to the first 
question in our first discussion, if you think of it as conflicts, then yes, there are different <laughs> national approaches, yes. Um, if you think of it, the sort of the classical private international law, if you think of it in terms of that we were talking about that let's think of it as the portfolio of some of these organizations, I would say that there is not um, a American view, but I think that one aspect of developing private international law in the U.S. that has an impact on that development and what we're able to um, negotiate successfully will in fact involve questions of state and federal yeah. law and what's likely to be implemented. And sometimes it won't be a state federal issue, it might be an issue between consumer and business. I mean, and, and different countries even have different protections and ways of protecting. So consumer protection is one way in the European community. In the US, we focus more on private enterprise to some extent. We focus on um, fraud, but we may not be willing to say, no, you can't have pre-dispute. You, we will, sorry, we're not willing to say we're going to forbid binding pre-dispute arbitration or what the Europeans would see as the blocking court access. So, I mean, I'm not sure that it's a, U it's a U.S. private international law as much as underlying policies af affect all countries when they negotiate. Clearly, and, and part of the difference from our point of view is a function of, of a, we're a common law country as opposed to a civil law country and often in my experience the difficulties arise when you're talking across that common law civil law divide. Um, the differences in approach, differences of terminology, it's one of the challenges of, and, and the great benefits of doing things in an international organization is you've got to talk about people who are trained in the law differently, who think about it differently, whose, whose structures of a process. The other big difference of course is that we are more litigious than most other countries in the world and our concepts of jurisdiction um, treble damages, punitive damages, um, loser pays kinds of things cause real problems in, in, um, in a number of areas that we've talked about. So yeah, there can be maybe not a, an American uh, approach to a private international law, but some uniquely American perspectives and problems uh, that, that uh, we bring to the table that others find quite frustrating sometimes. Do you agree with that or not? Um. Yes, although you you raised jurisdiction and I would just say that I'm not sure our views as currently are indicated by the Supreme Court are now as significantly um, problematic for other countries as they were 20 years ago. Uh, uh, we've, we've tended to restrict our jurisdiction and other countries have moved more broadly. The pendulum does seem to be moving. Yes. Uh, another question here, they're coming fast, we don't have too much time yet. What role does, does or should choice of law play in private international law matters? Party autonomy is big in the commercial context, should private international law encourage choice of law, or choice of forum in other areas? Would that create regulatory problems? Um, another way to put that is um, uh, maybe to ask whether, in your view, you're an expert in in choice of, of law uh, kinds of things. Um, is that really the conceptual starting point for this all? Uh, is that really at the heart of private international issues, choice of law? Um, I, I'm not sure I can, can give it a real answer to that. I would say that party autonomy certainly um, increasingly has become a focus in much discussion, not just in commercial, in family law. I mean, one of the big questions is what role parenting plans should be given in family law, but the parents agreeing and or um, mediated agreements between parents, that's party autonomy 
uh, among the, the in, a, in a sense, and what role should it play in family law? So I think party autonomy is not just limited to commercial law. Um, I'm not sure I answered the other part of your question, which is how important is choice of law? And I think as soon as you cross borders, it becomes an issue unless you have all legal systems that have the same underlying substantive law. Which doesn't happen often. Doesn't happen often. The cho choice of law is one of the most important things if you're in a transnational practice. Yeah. Having a good grasp on that. Um, the OAS has an initiative to educate regional judges on conventions. Is such an initiative necessary in the U.S.? Um, if so, how might it be implemented? I think you really suggested um, an answer to that, but it's a, it's a good question, so would you like to elaborate? Um, how to help the judges within the OAS countries? Well, in saying or that... Bring, or or more bring, in the United, I take the question to be, should we be doing more to educate pri U.S. judges on private international law things? Can the ASIL or other organization conduct similar training? I think, in fact, well, it's, been, it's happened. It's happened, hasn't it? Yeah, and that the American Society has done a number of training sessions on international law generally, and I know that you advocated including private international law as one of those topics. Um, yeah, I've done one or two of those, and I have to say uh, most of the judges, when they think about international law, federal judges don't think about private international law. They think more about something like the Alien Tort Statute. So I think raising awareness, I think that can be a, a very legitimate uh, a goal for Professional organizations, the ABA has a great deal of, um, uh, of such activities. The ASIL, um, I, wasn't, I know the OAS has a number of training programs, and, and those are also good. I think um, there, there's a great deal of education that needs to go on to, uh, and one reason why we have this webinar is to uh, alert folks to the activities in the field of international law and why they're relevant, why it's not just a, a little corner of professorial uh, attention, but is actually a very important and practical a field uh, that uh, it deserves attention and deserves uh, uh, involvement. And I think it's easier for people to learn. There's more to learn, but it's a lot easier to learn about private international law and how other countries treat areas given the technology and the access to foreign law. Um, Twenty years ago, getting access to the OAS convention on something would be very difficult or to get access to how a German court is interpreting the CISG um, or how other courts interpret the Hague abduction convention and though the access to foreign law is very important both in the area of both model laws but certainly conventions trying to get an international interpretation um, the CISG article 7 says it should be interpreted that way and UNCITRAL has clout and PACE Law School has a website the Hague Conference for Abduction has INCADAT um, these are all important and in fact there has been um, a, multiple attempts to get the Hague Conference to take up access to foreign law and to do a an instrument, a binding instrument, um, but that hasn't gone further. But I do think that it's easier for people and therefore it's more of a malpractice if you don't know about the CISG for instance, and you represent a small business in the U.S. and it's doing a, a sale um, of goods and cross-border, and you represent the seller. And it really is malpractice if you don't know something about it. That's the flip side. So yeah. educational programs are important. We have just a few minutes left. So let me give you the final uh, uh, opportunity. Um, one uh, listener, uh, participant, has said, can you give an anecdote or two, maybe two short ones, one longer one, of the most memorable event uh, uh, in your private international law career? Anything st uh, stands out or, or, or strikes you as, uh, as memorable in, in terms of, uh, of your multi, uh, uh, your varied career, your multi-organizational participation? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and I think I've had a range of experiences and it was um, very exciting when we finished the Choice of Court Convention to actually, in the Peace Palace, you, you actually sign the document as part of a delegation that the convention is finished. And you somehow think that's the easy part, but really the getting it ratified is, is years away. Um, it's also exciting to, to have an impact when a, a parent tells you that their child has been returned and that the abduction convention worked. Um, so I guess seeing it on a personal level, the impact it has on an individual, a parent who gets a child back, or sometimes a parent who doesn't get a child back because the convention isn't in force in that country um, really does does make um, a difference and um, I think that's what keeps one doing the work yeah, and realize it's important thank you very much for Professor Tights for sharing your experience and your expertise thanks to Professor Strong and the American Society of International Law PIL interest group it's been an honor to participate thank you for your conversation it has been an honor thank you, thank you. And this is Professor Strong signing off, um, thanking both of our speakers for sharing their wonderful expertise and experience with all of us. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is the first of our PILIG um, webinars. If any of the listeners have any ideas for future webinars, please let me know, um, Professor Stacy Strong or my co-chair, Christian Jimenez Corte, and um, we will hopefully schedule one of these in a few months' time. Thank you very much, and have a lovely afternoon.